Hey everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is my first video on Leighton Flowers, or rather, to be respectful, Dr. Leighton Flowers, and his opposition to Calvinism. Because I am of the opinion that he is the leading critic on Calvinism. I am a Calvinist, so because when I become a reverend in the future, I know that people in my congregation are going to stumble on some of this stuff. I am just making sure that these videos that are going to be on this playlist, which is going to be entitled Adrian King versus Leighton Flowers, or Leighton Flowers versus Adrian King. I'm gonna, you know what? I'm going to do that. Leighton Flowers versus Adrian King, just so that when people go in their search engine and I have enough of these videos up, I'll pop up and they will see that all of what Leighton Flowers has to say about Calvinism is easily refuted, is easily proven wrong, and turns out to be emotionalism, intuitive argumentation that's based on analogesis and not exegesis. What's analogesis? Analogesis is when, as you'll see with the following videos that are going to be coming up, whenever Leighton Flowers tries to prove a point, he uses an analogy that is absolutely and totally humanistic and apply it to God when it is disanalogous. Humanistic analogies aren't all wrong, but when he uses them and applies them to God, well, you'll see. You'll see that most of the time, his analogies are disanalogous, and most of the time, that is what he uses as his basis for exegesis, which is not exegesis. It's analogesis. <laughs> Anyways. Leighton Flowers, I have nothing against you. I love you as a man. Love you as a person. And I love you as a brother. Even though some of the things that you say in your videos give me doubts that you are even a Christian. Because you sometimes talk like an open theist and a deist and a dualist which are not Christian doctrines but I don't see anywhere in any of our creeds or in the Bible for that matter that if you hold deistic dualistic and you know I'm hesitant to say open theistic beliefs that you're not Christian. What I'm going to do is, for the sake of not being too controversial, I'm going to say that Leighton Flowers is a brother in Christ who is mistaken. And I hope that the videos that will be forthcoming won't cause me to change my mind and say that he's not Christian. But definitely... You are going to be seeing that as these videos come up on this playlist, Dr. Leighton Flowers, well, I'm going to say Leighton Flowers because a lot of people don't know he's a doctor. I'm going to say Leighton Flowers versus Adrian King, Calvinism. Anyways, let's look at what his page says, just so that we can all be on the same page, bro. All of us. Let's have a look at this. Bring it up so you can all see what's going on here. So, and I want to make sure that I do something that is important. Here we go. I'm going to read this for you just in case you can't see it. I'm going to read here. 
and then I'm going to read here. Dr. Leighton Flowers, former Calvinistic professor, explains why Calvinism is not biblical. Our channel is dedicated to providing you with insightful and engaging content that will challenge your perspective on Calvinism and help you understand the flaws in its teaching. Our videos cover teachings on predestination, election, and the doctrines of grace. Join the conversation and gain a deeper understanding of the controversial topic of Calvinism. Subscribe and hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest content. So, his YouTube channel is about one thing, and that is Calvinism. And as you all know, I am a Calvinist, which means that those who will be under my charge when I am a reverend will be Calvinists as well. And as the Bible says, we are to be ready always to give an answer to anyone who asks us about the hope that is in us. We are to do this with reverence, with fear, with respect, with love. And these videos are not going to be condescending or disrespectful in any way to Leighton Flowers. But maybe I will be a little bit passionate when I am refuting his ideology because ultimately that's the enemy, not Leighton Flowers. His ideologies are the enemy. His ideologies that go against the Word of God and the Bible is the enemy, not him. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to play one of his earliest videos. Why is my video freezing up on me? Oh boy, I hope this is, doesn't become a problem. Okay, so we're going to play this video and we're going to react to it. Videos oldest watch this last night because as you will all know and notice Leighton Flowers when he puts videos up they are upwards of two hours which I'm going to have to be reacting to and refuting it's best I start with his early videos and Man, I'm so tempted to click on this one. R.C. Sproul Jr.'s teaching on irresistible grace rebutted. Ugh, but I'm not going to do that. We're going to look at this one. It was posted eight years ago, and we're going to see and hear what Leighton Flowers has to say. Does God genuinely desire for all people to be saved? No. Some Calvinist. No. God does not desire for all people to be saved. Because if he did, then all people would be saved. There is something in the Bible, and this is not just Calvinism, it's biblical. God has two wills. God has a decreative will. And God has a prescriptive will. God's decreative will is God's will that determines all that takes place in time and all that comes to pass in time. Because nothing happens in time that is not the will of God. And then you have God's prescriptive will, which is God's will of command. For God says, Thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal. Repent of your sins, believe in Christ, submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Commence. And we know that this is not contradictory. Why? Because when you look up the meaning in logic for the law of contradiction or the law of non-contradiction, it states this. Something cannot be both true and false in the same way and the same sense. 
But something can be true and false in different ways and different senses. That's not a contradiction. Look it up if you want. When we say that God doesn't want all people to be saved in his decreative will, and we say that he commands all people to be saved in his prescriptive will, in God's prescriptive will, the argument can be made. He wants all people to be saved because he commands all people to be saved. And in his commands, he is expressing that which he wants to come to pass. But not all people will be saved because God does not want all people to be saved. He has chosen some for salvation freely, and he has chosen some for damnation freely before the foundation of the world. Which means that if God did not have two wills, then you have a contradiction where God is wanting all people to be saved and simultaneously not wanting all people to be saved in the same way and the same sense, which would be a contradiction. But since that's not the case and God has two wills, it is not a contradiction. God can want some to be saved in his decretive will and brings about their salvation irresistibly and certainly. And God, in his prescriptive will, can want all people to be saved and it not be a contradiction. But Leighton Flowers denies that God has two wills, which means that in his perspective on when God permits evil and ordains evil, God is allowing something to happen that he does not want to happen which means that he is willing something that he is unwilling to occur, which is a direct contradiction. Because you have an example of something being A and not A at the same time in the same way. Juliana, Juliana, you plugged out the screen. I want you to, I want you to, to, the screen just came back on. I want you to not go there at all, okay? Thank you, honey. Thank you very much. Okay, just to answer that first one. Does God want all people to be saved? No, he doesn't. He doesn't. Because God only elects some for salvation and damns all the rest. And I'm going to give you some I'm going to give you a logical reason because I'm a Calvinist because of what the Bible says and because of logical coherence. God knows all things. He knows all things. Any Christian perspective that believes that God knows all things has to answer this question. And here we go. Since God knows that by creating you, you will end up in hell, how has God not determined that you go to hell by creating you? That's because the answer is he has determined that you go to hell by creating you. Because God knows all things and he could create you in any way he wants and create you and place you anywhere in the world that he wants. He is in absolute control of where you end up when you are created and you eventually die in all perspectives of Christianity that propose that God knows all things the Calvinist says that God determines that you go to hell and God decrees that you go to hell if you end up in hell God is not trying to save anyone and failing and God is not trying to save anyone that he does not want to save God doesn't even try at all. Those whom he has decreed to save will be saved and will never perish. But let's continue. I must very vehemently support and defend the fact that God does absolutely want everyone to be saved. I've heard David Platt, for example, make this absolute. Hey. Does God genuinely desire for all people to be saved? already answered that. Some Calvinists very vehemently support and defend the fact that God does absolutely want everyone to be saved. If those Calvinists don't make the distinction 
that I just made, which is orthodox Calvinism. God has two wills, which is also biblical. Because it was the will of God that Jesus Christ be murdered to be a sacrifice for all those who would believe. It's God's will. It is also God's will that we not murder. That's a quintessential example of God having two wills. God says, thou shalt not murder. And God determines that Pontius Pilate, the people of Israel, and the Gentiles put Jesus to death innocently, which is murder. <laughs> Acts chapter 2, verse 23, and chapter 4, verse 27 and 28. Look it up. So if the Calvinist that he's making mention, making reference to, doesn't make the distinction, then that Calvinist is wrong. I've heard David Platt, for example, make this argument that God absolutely has a sincere desire for, for all people to be saved, even in the Calvinistic system, the non-elect. Now, however... In his prescriptive will, where he commands all people to repent, trust in Christ, and believe, the argument can be made that God genuinely, in his prescriptive will, wants them to repent, wants them to believe, wants them to turn from their sins, because he has commanded it. But in his decreative will, not all will be saved, therefore God does not want all to be saved. So we have him wanting them to be saved, and not wanting them to be saved, which is not a contradiction because it is in different ways and different senses. However inconsistent that that may seem to us, um, we have to accept what they state as their actual premise on its, its value. In other words, even though it doesn't seem logically consistent for God to have a genuine desire for someone he hasn't atoned for or that he has not chosen uh, to be saved or to give the capacity to respond in any way, shape, or form from birth, that may seem... God has given every human being the capacity to respond. This is what we call the natural ability, natural faculty ability. All of us have the ability to turn from our sins. All of us have the ability to say no to sin. All of us have the ability. That is why you find that people who are not Christians, they are very religious <laughs> because you have the natural faculty ability. But what we do say in Calvinism, and it's biblical as well, is that we don't have the moral ability. The moral ability is the inability to, 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 to do a certain thing because you don't desire to do it, not because you can't do it physically or naturally, but because morally. Example, I can't kill my daughter. I can't. I can't. Does that mean I don't have the natural ability? There are 101 million ways that I could, you know, but I can't because I don't want to. I don't. So when he says we don't have the capacity, he's misrepresenting Calvinism because he did not make the necessary distinction. And as well, it is logically inconsistent for God to send his son to die for people who will not be saved or atone for people who will not be saved. Let me play that again. Very or to, he hasn't atoned for or that he has not sent for God to have a genuine desire for someone he hasn't atoned for or that he has not chosen uh, to be saved or to give the capacity to respond. Yeah, yeah, so... It is not logically inconsistent for God to genuinely want people to be saved who he hasn't atoned for in his prescriptive will. It is not logically inconsistent. No, no, it's not. Because his prescriptive will is for every human being. But in his decreative will, it is logically inconsistent. That is why God does not want all people to be saved in his decreative will. Because God is not only the God of all truth, but he is the God of all logic. <laughs> God is logical. So, 
if if it's logical, you can bet that it's biblical. In any way, shape, or form from birth, that may seem very inconsistent to us. And be most of the time correct. But the Calvinist, um, many do argue that God does have in some manner, in some way, a genuine longing for and a desire for all to come to salvation. As a former Calvinist, why not just say Calvinists have a category that we call his prescriptive will where God genuinely desires all to be saved? Make the distinction. Make the distinction so there's no confusion. Even the non-elect. Now, again, some Calvinists don't take that approach because they do recognize the logical inconsistency of that view, and thus they explain away very hard to explain away text. I think Dr. James White um, and um, someone like Arthur Pink, um, Gill, for example, higher forms of Calvinism would attempt to explain away very clear passages that seem to give um, a strong indication that God does desire the salvation of all men. For example, the top three, the big three that they all often refer to, um, of course, 2 Peter 3, 9, God is patient towards you. 2 Peter 3, 9, let's look at that. 2 Peter 3, 9. Let's go. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And this is supposed to mean that God wants all to come to repentance. So, let's talk about this. Even if this was teaching that God wants all to come to repentance, we could throw this verse into his prescriptive will, which is biblical. But, fortunately, we don't have to, because this verse is not talking about all people. This letter is addressing the Christians. When you look at verse 1 of Second Peter, it says, Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. By the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Received a faith. Because Peter also believed, as John did, that faith is the work of God and a gift from God. And not only John and Peter, but also Paul, who taught that we are not only granted to suffer for the name of Christ or the sake of Christ, but we are also granted to believe. So faith is a gift from God an irresistible gift from God. When God gives it, we believe. This is speaking of the elect, the people of God. If you have ever heard of the word antecedent, you will know what I'm about to say and what, what I'm going to say means. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you. Who's the you? the Christians in this passage, not wishing for any, what is the antecedent for the word any? You. So, patient toward you, not wishing for any of you to perish, but for all of you to come to repentance. And there's no problem. There is no problem. God is not slow about his promise as some count slowness toward his elect but is patient toward his elect not wishing for any of his elect to perish but for all of his elect to come to repentance why am i mentioning the word elect so much because in first peter that word is actually used first peter chapter 1 verse 1 peter an apostle of jesus christ to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who are elect. First Peter and Second Peter is addressed to the elect, and by extension, all the elect who read this passage. God wants all of his elect to come to repentance, and they will, because that passage 
2 Peter 3 9 is not in reference to God's prescriptive will. It is in reference to his decretive will. And God's decretive will always comes to pass without fail. Absolutely certain. Not wishing that any should perish and um, all to come to repentance. Matthew 23, 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, um, how often would I have gathered your children, but you were not willing. Matthew 23, 37. Let's go there. You can go there too in your Bible, and I apologize if this video is going too long. 2337, the Word of God says these words Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. The Greek word used there is thelo, u thelo, not willing. What is this making reference to? Is this a salvation passage or a judgment passage? Judgment passage. This is Jesus's indictment on the Jewish rulers. It starts at verse 13 in this chapter. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people. For you do not enter in yourself, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. I'm a preacher of God's word. It is in my capacity to hinder someone's salvation. It is in my capacity to hinder someone learning the truth. It is in my capacity. Will I ultimately stop someone from going to heaven who God has decreed to go to heaven? No. But I can contribute to their deception. I can contribute to their hindrance. I can contribute to their stumbling. All of those contributions, all of those contributions are decreed and determined by God that I do and be judged for it. The same way God sent prophets to lie and then judge them for it. The same way God determined that Pharaoh would not let the Egyptians go and then punish him for it. The same way God hardened the hearts of the people who went against the Israelites and then punished them for it. God can ordain that I do these things and punish me for it. I can also mention the Assyrians. God sent to do things to Israel and then punish them for it. God decrees and ordains that we sin and then punishes us for it, which is not inconsistent. And I can explain that logically as we go along and as future videos come up when I address these topics. But this passage is Jesus indicting the Jewish leaders for hindering people from going into the kingdom, from hindering the gathering of God of his people. God judges them for that. Judges them for that. But, say again, ultimately, they can't stop God from gathering his people. God can ordain that someone stop God from gathering his people before the time because on storyline level, on the storyline level, we can all observe when a Christian goes to someone and preaches the gospel to them and they reject the gospel for reasons that we can identify such as they're believing a false prophet, they're believing a lie, they're trusting in a lie. We can all observe those storyline reasons why people reject the gospel. But if those people were chosen by God before the foundation of the world to be saved, that rejection is just for a time. And the people who contributed to their rejection will be judged in the end on the level of, <clears throat> on the other side of heaven, when they die or 
on the Day of Judgment. But I want to put this out there right now. There are transcendental reasons why things happen, which is God's decree, and there are storyline levels as to why things happen, which is God's written purpose. He He's the author, he's the divine author of all our lives and what takes place in our lives and as a sustainer and creator of all things. Storyline reasons. There are storyline reasons why things happen. But the ultimate reason why everything happens is God. But let's move on to the next passage. So Matthew 23, 37. It's not about God trying to save someone, and he can't, but rather God judging people for being contributors in the hindrance of people becoming believers, who will ultimately become believers by God's decree if they are elected. Uh, 1 Timothy 2.4, God desires all people to be saved. 1 Timothy 2.4, let's get to, into that, and I'm going to show you why this is particular passage is very problematic if you interpret it the way Dr. Leighton Flowers is interpreting it. To two four, okay. Um Second Timothy two four, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. All right, let's get into this. Context, context, context. First of all, verse 1. First of all, then I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. Okay, now Paul is going to describe and define what all men means. Verse 2, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is... Paul using all men in the perspective of categories, all kinds of men, all kinds of men, but specifically for those in the category of authority, of leadership. And he says, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. And then we hear the verse, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. You know why we got to interpret this as all kinds of men? Because of the preceding context, the preceding verses. And because what comes after knocks the nail on the head. Verse 5, for there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Watch this, verse 6. Who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. If we don't interpret all men to be all kinds of men in verse 4, then we have Jesus in verse 5 mediating for all men under the sun. I'm going to use these categories. If verse 4 is about all men without exception, then verse 5 is problematic because we have Jesus Christ mediating for all men without exception. And if Jesus mediates for anyone as the high priest, they are saved. And this leads us to universalism, which is unbiblical. But because it is all kinds of men, in that Jesus mediates for all kinds of men without distinction, all men without distinction, not all men without exception. All men without distinction. We have Jesus mediating for all kinds of men who believe by the grace of God. That is why the following verse says, Who gave himself as a ransom for all. Who's the all? All kinds of men. All men without distinction. The testimony given at the proper time. Because whoever God gives himself, sorry, whoever Christ, who is also God, gives himself as a ransom for, all of their sins are forgiven. All of their sins are destroyed. The sea of forgetfulness. 
which is why, as he mentioned earlier, anyone who Christ has atoned for will be saved. That is why, Scripture says, my sheep will never perish. That is why, Scripture says, no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand, no one can snatch them out of my hand. That is why the Bible also says, <coughs> he is able to save perfectly based upon his intercession. Those who draw near to God through him. And who does the drawing? God. John chapter 6, verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. But let's continue. And to come to the knowledge of truth. And um, oftentimes you'll hear Calvinists give explanation of those particular texts by saying, for example, in Second uh, Peter 3, 9, that God is patient towards you, meaning the elect ones. He is and that's the biblical view. That's the correct interpretation. Patient towards his elect, um, not wishing that any of his elect should perish. Right. Um, I, I think this is a huge um, misapplication of that text. I think. No, it can't be because First Peter chapter one verse one identifies the elect. Second Peter chapter one verse one states that those this letter has been written to are the ones who has received the same faith as we. So that is what it means. But because of his emotionalism and his intuitiveness and his tradition, he has to deny that biblical fact. But let's continue. I think it's missing um, Peter's uh, comments as you read the entire chapter in its context. It's, it seems very clear that Peter is indicating that he is talking about the lost and the salvation for all and his patience for all people that come to him. And that's the thing with Leighton Flowers. You will, you will almost, I'm not going to say never, because there's no way. He never looks at context. What I've heard about Leighton Flowers is that he never looks at the context. And what I'm absolutely certain about is that in this video, he does not tell us from the context why the Calvinistic interpretation is wrong. He doesn't. He just says, well, in the context, it says that it's all people, including the lost, that God generally wants to come to repentance. Which is no problem with Calvinism, because we can say that if that's the case, his prescriptive world wants all people to be saved, genuinely. But the creatively, no. And in this text, no. Because this text specifically identifies the recipients. And the recipients are the elect. Chapter 1, verse 1 in 1 Peter mentions the elect. Chapter 1, verse 1, 2 Peter, those who have received the same faith as ours. Um, also, you see in Matthew 23, 37, the explanation is given. Um, I've heard Dr. White explain that it's not the actual people that God is longing for to come, but his, their children, meaning that those there are, I guess, some people who would come that the Israelite leaders aren't allowing to, or they're not allowing him them to hear the word. But again, I'm not... I already explained that. And notice, when he says, what, what he's doing is he's saying, hey, you know, that doesn't make any sense, that's wrong, that's so on and so forth. But he doesn't give a positive presentation as to what it means and why he says it means what he says in context. Just, well, no, it, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't make any sense. It's wrong. And as you'll see, as these videos progress, his reasons are based in his emotionalism and how he intuits what's right and wrong. Not sure how that does away with the conflict within the Calvinistic system that God <clears throat> always accomplishes what He desires because it clearly expresses that God wants something that they are unwilling to to give Him or that they're unwilling to allow, and and He's expressing in a sense frustration, which goes right along with. I'm not explaining that again, but uh, just go back on the video. With there is going to be a there is going to be timestamps where you can look and 
see when these verses are addressed. Just, just go back to it and then come back here and we'll see if you understand. Luke 19.42, which does also express Jesus' weeping over Israel um, and, and, and the, his weeping over them becoming blinded to the fact of who he really is. And so which is consistent with God's prescriptive will. Example. <clears throat> it is not unusual for Jesus to weep over something that he has determined to take place or decreed to take place. If it doesn't make sense to you, that's okay. But here's here's the example. <coughs> Sorry. John chapter 11, verse 4. This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God. Jesus purposely made himself absent so that Lazarus could die for a purpose, which is to glorify God. And Jesus determined that this would happen. And he knew that this was going to happen. And the shortest verse in the Bible, John 11.35, Jesus wept. It is not unusual for Jesus to weep over people who he has determined to be in the condition that they are in, which is to be lost and haters of God. It's not unusual. It's scriptural. <coughs> which supports the fact that God genuinely, in his prescriptive will, wants all people to repent and believe. But ultimately, not all will repent and believe because God has decreed and determined ultimately all who will believe and repent. Leighton Flowers is looking at this from a human perspective exclusively. It wouldn't make any sense for a human being to weep over something that he has determined to take place. Therefore, God can't weep over something that he has determined to take place. God is not a man. He's not a man. He's not you. He's not me. He's a perfect man in Jesus Christ. The God-man is a perfect man. We are fallible men. We are fallible creatures. We are not God. So we should not compare ourselves to God. And we should not put God in our human box. Let's not do that. Let's not do that. Continuing on. Um, 1 Timothy 2.4, um, the Calvinists will all, often explain that within the context of the kings and authorities trying to express that um, God uh, really wants all sorts of people to be saved, that, it's, that he, he hasn't rejected all the kings and peoples and authorities or uh, people who have wealth and those kinds of Wait, things. Hasn't um, within the context of the kings and authorities trying to express that um, God uh, really wants all sorts of people to be saved, that it's that he, he hasn't rejected all the kings and peoples and authorities or uh, people who have wealth and those kinds of things, that he, he doesn't just want wealthy people or he doesn't just want affluent people, that he wants all sorts. Right, 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 right. The, the interpretation I gave earlier, First Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. What is he going to say to refute what I just said? Let's listen sorts of people is the way that I'll explain that. Again, I think it's putting dynamite to the text, as even Charles Spurgeon uh, says. If, if God wanted to say all sorts of people, dynamite to the text, Spurgeon says, then he could have said, and he could have inspired the author, Paul, to say all sorts of people. Charles Spurgeon was not a, was not a systematic theologian. He's a prince of preachers, great preacher, great man of God, who's also a Calvinist, by the way. But he was just wrong about this passage. That verse doesn't have to say all kinds of people. The context requires that you understand it as saying all kinds of people. 
because verse 5 and verse 6 leads you to universalism. If you don't, and verse 1, verse 2 gives you the basis for interpreting verse 4 as meaning all kinds of men. The context is clear. But he, as you will see, all he did was say, this is just putting dynamite to the text. What does that mean? And what are you going to say to refute that understanding? Um, and he thinks it's putting dynamite to the text to try to take away the inclusiveness of that statement. And so, um, and, and Spurgeon goes on to say, I'd rather be inconsistent with myself and my, my theological systems. And he was. If Spurgeon said that, he was inconsistent. Than being consistent with the word of God or to lop off any twig within the, the forest of, of the, the scriptures of, of God's word. And um, it's a great quote from Spurgeon just reminding us not to take the text too far, as I believe some of the higher forms of Calvinists do. There are... It's not taking the text too far. It's interpreting the text in its context and being faithful to what the Word of God says. Are, however, a lot more than just three passages, which clearly indicate um, God's love and his longing for Israel. Uh, for example, we see Romans 10, 21, but he, and he says, But of Israel, he says, All day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Um, we often have idioms. With In his prescriptive will. Prescriptive will. His will of command. His will of command. Prescriptive will. All of these things show us over and over again the consistency of God's word. Because, listen, listen carefully. God is holding out his hand to a disobedient people, right? Of course. That's what the text says. You know what else the Bible says? Deuteronomy 29, verse, verse 3. <laughs> Deuteronomy 29, verse 4. To this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to know, nor eyes to see, nor ears to hear. God doesn't give them the moral ability to believe in his decree, in his decreative will. God gives them the natural faculty ability to believe. And in his command, he says, repent, turn from your sins. And also in his prescriptive will, he can long for his people. He can stretch out his hand. I do want you to come. Repent, repent, repent. This is how you keep the Bible consistent and coherent. By applying the biblical principle that God has two wills. If you conflate them, you put yourself in logical problems and you contradict God's word. Within our, our language, the concept of holding out your hands, um, that's one that even carries over to the English language. We, we think about uh, our two little, our little children, we hold out our hands to our kids, come to me, come here, come here, come here. This is, this is the image he's painting here, of that God's held out his hands and all day long is not just talking about one day. Did you see that analogy to, to tweak and pull on your emotions? You see it? Anyways, think logically, my friends. Stay consistent, my friends. When he says all day long, he's, he's, he's giving the image of him holding out for a long time, Excuse for me. a longing patience uh, for these people, that he longs after them. I hear very few Calvinists talk about Romans 10.21. Or... I just did. Hold on. <coughs> I'm sorry about that. Lost my voice because I went really hard on the preaching recently, the last video, on my sermon playlist. I apologize. Still recovering. Or Hosea 3.1, for example, 
where it literally states in part, the Lord loves the sons of Israel, though they turn to other gods. Now let me say Right. I mean, God is married to the backslider. Jeremiah chapter 3, I think it's 14. Chapter 3, verse 14. God is married to the backslider. When a true believer strays away from God, God does not stop loving them. He draws them back, he pulls them back. Hosea 3.1 is a verse about backsliding. It's a verse that can be applied to the Christian reality that we sometimes fall into sin, but God still loves us. This is not in reference to every human being who ever lived, and this is not in reference to every Israelite, because a remnant was saved. Those who are elect were saved, and the rest were hardened. Romans chapter 11, just say. Let me say that again. How do you get around that? <clears throat> the Lord loves the sons of Israel, though... I didn't get around it. I explained the biblical truth behind it. Oh, they turn to other gods. He acknowledges they're turning away while first acknowledging his love for them. And so By the way, everyone, I'm so sorry that I'm pausing so much and you're probably going to skip me because or stop this video right now because I'm stopping and pausing too much. This is my first reaction video. So... I don't have reaction video etiquette yet, but as you continuing as you continue on these playlists, this playlist rather, you will notice that I get better and better and better at reacting to videos because I know I've been pausing a lot, but let's see if there is because he's saying so much to respond to. This this is just what it is. But I hope that you, the Calvinist, who's listening to this you are armed and dangerous by now regarding these passages that he's quoting. So how anyone can get away with trying to dismiss these passages as not expressing God's genuine love and desire? We are not dismissing those passages as expressing God's genuine love and desire. We're not. We're not. Because it is genuine love and desire but not in the same way that we have genuine love and desire because we are not God. God has two wills. We have one will. And when we force God into our humanistic box, we contradict Scripture and we make God out to be something that he's not. Um, we haven't even got into many of them. <clears throat> Ezekiel 18, uh, 30 and 31, where he calls Israel to repentance. He says, repent and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit, which is, uh, I think, another theological point that needs to be brought up. How do you get a new heart and a new spirit? Repent. Good, 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 good. All right. This is an example of God commanding something that only he can do. And this is not unusual for God to give us commands that we cannot do. God commands us to be perfect. Can we be perfect? No, we can't. God says that we should be holy as he is holy. Can we be holy as God is holy? No, we can't. It is not unusual for God to command us to do things that we can't do. Morally speaking, morally speaking, Deuteronomy 10, 16, the Bible says, circumcise your heart and stiffen your neck no longer. And then the Bible also says, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 5, the Lord your God will bring you into the land Wait, I don't think that that's it. Wait, wait, wait. Deuteronomy 30. I think it's verse 6. Yes, it is. Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants 
to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul so that you may live. So we have God commanding us to circumcise our heart and we have the Bible saying that God is the one who circumcises our heart. Brethren, faith comes by hearing and by hearing the word of God. The way I explain this is by saying that when you look at a command in Scripture to circumcise your heart, that's God's word that is effective. And what it does is it causes you to repent. And when it causes you to repent, an inward reality has taken place. And that is God changing your heart through circumcision. But through circumcising your heart. But let's go to the passage he quoted, which is Deuteronomy, no, not Deuteronomy, which is Ezekiel 18. Ezekiel 18, uh, verse 30 and 31. It says, Cast away from you all your transgressions which you have committed, and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die? Did Ezekiel, in this book, teach that God is the one who is the ultimate cause of you having a new heart and a new spirit. Does it teach that? Of course. <coughs> Deuteronomy 36, 26. It says, Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. God is the one who is ultimate in causing you to have a new heart and a new spirit. It is not unusual for God to command you to do something that you cannot do morally. He does all the time. He commands us to repent and we can't repent morally. He commands us to be holy and we can't do it morally because we don't desire to do so. We don't, but we have the natural faculty ability. And because we do have the natural faculty ability, we are held accountable for not doing that which God has commanded us to do because responsibility is an aspect of creation. God has given us a law, and he has determined that we break his law and hold us accountable. How can God hold us accountable for something that <laughs> we can't do? Because we can do it. We just don't want to do it. Storyline reasons, but ultimate reasons as well. So as to make yourselves a new heart and new spirit, Ezekiel chapter um, 18, verse 30 says. Repentance is a gift of God, by the way. It's Acts chapter 5, 31, Acts chapter 11, verse 18. So you can't even repent unless God gives you repentance. So he just said that, how do you get a new heart and new spirit? Repent, meaning you're the one who can repent and get yourself a new heart and a new spirit. The Bible teaches otherwise. Repentance is a gift from God. A new heart and a new spirit is a gift from God. And those gifts are irresistible because when God sets out to change your heart, you can't stop him. When he does, what he does in essence is give you new desires. And those desires cause you to do different things such as repent, believe, serve God, submit to God, submit to Christ's Lordship, be a Christian. Why will you die, O house of Israel? <laughs> Question mark. For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord. So turn and live. There's clearly a longing for. And of course, prescriptive will. Of course. A, a, a call to these people to repent. Dr. White, for example, he explains this as just God's prescriptive will. Like a, a doctor will give a prescription. And correctly so. Here's what you're to do. Here's what rightly so you're supposed to do as if it's a just a command and there's real no there's no real divine desire behind the command that's a problem right there you see what he just did he conflated the wills of god there is no desire of course there is a desire of course in god's prescriptive will you just denied. <clears throat> you just misrepresented the Calvinistic view. 
But that is not what Scripture indicates. It is obvious through all of these texts and many more that I'm not even reading right now that God expresses a longing for and a patience for and in his prescriptive will. Yes. The love for these people. <clears throat> now, the fact the love for his people who are the elect and only the elect. The fact that many Calvinists disagree <clears throat> with John uh, with James White and higher forms of Calvinists is another um, reason to really question this teaching because they obviously can't blame, for example, John MacArthur for being biased because men like John MacArthur and other um, more moderate or mainstream type <clears throat> Calvinists who do believe that God has a genuine love and a genuine desire for even the non-elect, these, these Calvinists... And those are inconsistent Calvinists because the Bible is clear on this. You only have a problem when you conflate God's wills or say he only has one will. Calvinists that, that do, for example, there's, there's something called the well-intended offer or the well-meant offer of the gospel, that there is a genuine calling of God to repentance and reconciliation, that he genuinely wants that to happen. Now, I'll, like I said at the beginning, I agree with James White that the Calvinists, mainstream Calvinists that hold that view are very inconsistent logically. Right. Very inconsistent logically. Because Calvinism is biblical and logical. So if you deny the Bible and you deny its biblical teaching, which is Calvinism, then you're inconsistent and you're illogical. But that's without exception. Logically, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But if they want to appeal to the mystery of that and just say, I don't know how it is that God expresses his longing and his desire on one hand, but on the other hand, he works to keep that which he longs and desires from happening. As soon as, <clears throat> as soon as you appeal to mystery, you are no longer in the conversation. Just let us big boys talk about what we know to be true, biblically. There is no mystery here. God has two wills. One will, he determines that not all people are saved. And in his other will, prescriptive will, he commands all people to be saved. There's no contradiction, no mystery. Those who say it is, you're out of the conversation. You should not put things in the mystery box that don't belong in the mystery box. Um, I long and desire for this non-elect person to come to salvation, but I have bound this person over to disobedience from birth and have um, sealed them in a condition that they can't even respond to my revelation. Leighton Flowers, if you used to be a Calvinist, why not just state the truth about what Calvinists believe, about what you just said? If you had mentioned the two wills of God in your statement just now, there would be no confusion, no contradiction. But he conflates the wills of God. Um, that they can't even want to respond to my revelation, that I have chosen them and predetermined them for hell from before the foundation of the world, before they were ever born, and yet I'm expressing to them a true, genuine desire. Um, I didn't uh, provide atonement for them on the cross, as some of, of those who hold the five-point Calvinism would have to say as well. Um, atonement was not provided for them, but yet I'm offering or I am calling them to repentance, there, there is a genuine inconsistency here. So I, I do um, agree that J James... Yes, there is an inconsistency there, genuine inconsistency there, if you deny that God has two wills. That's just, that's just what it comes down to. That's why it is more consistent in his systematic. And so am I. James White and I and many other Calvinists are consistent. And let I let I also say, Colin, the the man who is behind the consistent Calvinism podcast, who I will link in this video, by the way. Um, then Charles Spurgeon or some of the more moderate mainstream Calvinists, because the mainstream Calvinist is willing to deal with that inconsistency. They're willing to live within that inconsistency and say things like Charles Spurgeon said, "I'm I'm fine with being inconsistent with myself. I'm not going to be inconsistent with the Word of God." So you. You know, guys like James White can't blame those people for being biased um, because they're they're obviously Calvinistic. They they are looking at the whole of Scripture, though, and you cannot get around these texts not without applying dynamite to them. 
and doing dynamite, doing all kinds of textual, textual gymnastics to get around. Textual gymnastics around God's obvious longing for and his desire for and his expression for these people to be saved Once you establish that God has two wills, which is absolutely clear in Scripture Everything he just said is cleared up everything and I have to because of my belief in God's trustworthiness because he is a trustworthy God I have to believe what he expresses out loud is true inwardly um, we can't trust someone who tells us something out loud, but secretly is two-faced and has a different will that he has in mind. Like he says, somebody says to you, here it comes, here it comes. The analogesis where he puts God in a box called humanity. He's going to make an analogy where if a human being says something, and mean something else. He's not trustworthy. Of course. But God is not in that category. He's not in that category. We human beings have one will. Individually. God is not us. Leighton, I would love for you to come and work for us. And then I, I go to apply for the job and I find out later through other people, that person had no desire for me to come work for them. That, that... And is God doing the same thing? That's what he's implying because he puts God in the humanistic box. God is not a human being. He's putting God in the box of a human being. He's destroying the fact that God is transcendent and God is beyond us and he's not us. The Bible says that his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We can't comprehend God. He's not us. And when you make comparisons and analogies like this, which are disanalogous, all you do is muddy the waters. All you do is create confusion and make it seem as though we Calvinists are saying that the same way a man can look at you and say that he really wants to hire you into his organization and then behind closed doors he doesn't want to hire you, of course that is dishonest and hypocritical. But are you saying that that is what Calvinists are saying? No, that's not what we're saying and I hope you're not saying that that's what we're saying. But for you to make a comparison like that seems like you're implying that we Calvinists believe that God is the same, that, that God is doing this exact thing that you are decrying. God is saying, come to me, come to me, but behind closed doors, he doesn't want you to come to him. That's dishonest, of course, if God only has one will, but he has two wills, which is established in scripture. I'm going to do it again. Acts chapter 2, verse 23. Acts chapter 4. Verse 27 and 28, God decrees the murder of his son. In his law, Exodus chapter 20, he says, you must not murder. So we have a command that says, thou shalt not murder. And we have God determining and decreeing that you murder his son. Two wills. And that's not the only example. That's just, in my opinion, the best example. So that's all I'm giving you. He denies that. He denies that. And creates confusion by comparing God to man and man to God and making it seem like God is like man when he's not. But let's continue. That person actually didn't like me at all. Um, that person didn't want me to come and work for my eye. He was just giving me platitudes. Um, I would think that person's deceptive. That person's two-faced. That person. And you think God is deceptive and God is two-faced if he does that. Because you put God in the box of being a human being when he's not. And deny that God has two wills. Which the Bible teaches, so in essence you're denying what the Bible teaches. He said something to me that he didn't really mean. Um, and I can't think that we should hold a belief like that of God. Where he expresses on one hand, I long for this, I want this to happen. But then we secretly find out through another passage or through another reading of a passage that God doesn't really want that. Um, and, and I think this becomes...
You know, I think he has a problem with the God of the Bible. Another passage or another reading of a passage. We find out that he wants something else. We shouldn't trust. He has a problem with the God of the Bible. Because I just gave you an example of God having two wills. Wanting something on one hand and wanting something else on another hand. But it is in different senses and different ways, which doesn't make it contradictory. But he denies that. And you're going to see as this playlist grows of me interacting and responding to his so-called refutations of Calvinism. That that's all he has. That's all he has. Denying what the Word of God says and doing so on the basis of his emotions and his human analogies. It's a, a problem for Calvinists because what they're doing is they're unwilling to bring to the text an explanation by which to say, as John Wesley says, whatever it means, it, it can't mean that. No, no. No. If you do that, <clears throat> then what you're doing is you are bringing to the text an external presupposition about who God is and who God has to be. And then when you read passages in the Bible that contradict that presupposition, you say or rather, if you're consistent, you have to say it can't mean that. Why? Because it contradicts your presupposition. And Leighton Flowers, sorry, Dr. Leighton Flowers, your presupposition that you have brought to the text is not consistent with the text. And this is why you are so inconsistent non-biblical in your understanding. In other words, if, if a passage comes across as meaning God is deceptive, or even implies that God is deceptive, based upon the analogy that you gave of an employer on a human level, not on transcendent level, not on God's level, the analogy you gave, Oh boy, this is going to be a journey. This is going to be a journey, guys. Not going to lie. <coughs> Sorry. This is going to be a journey. I'm going to be stressed out listening to Leighton Flowers <laughs> ideologies. I'm going to be stressed out, man, but I got to do this because my congregation, when they start stumbling on videos like this and others, they're going to need to have responses. And I have them. No worries, guys. I got them. Then whatever it means, it can't mean that. Um, and Calvinists are really good at explaining away passages that don't fit within their system. Anthropomorphic passages like, for example, God changing his mind or God relenting. They will, they will apply all kinds of textual explanations to help it soften that view. Well, do the same work with those passages. I would love to hear how you deal with those passages that speak about God changing his mind. Since, as far as I'm aware, you have a love affair with open theism, I would love to hear how he deals with those verses. But uh, <clears throat> I'm sure that as time goes by, they will come up and I will hear what he has to say about them. But we are not going to do any Bible gymnastics to try and get around passages that contradict our presupposition as you do. Because our presupposition is derived from the text, not from our tradition, not from our preconceived ideas about who God is and who God has to be, but rather from the text. So when we go to the text, we will give consistent exegesis, contextual reasons as to why we understand a passage to be what it says, not our emotionalism, not our human analogies, not our analogies, not our category errors and category fallacies, but rather through biblical, consistent hermeneutics. Passages that seem to express um, that God's being deceptive or that God is wanting something that's morally evil. Um, and when you do so, 
I think you come to very clear explanations of Scripture of the Old Testament that there were, at times, especially within historical poetic type languages, there are times in which God is given, quote, credit or blame for things that happen simply because he didn't prevent them from not happening. And it's not necessarily his active will or his desire for it to happen, but his permissive, where he's... God has no permissive will. None whatsoever. He decrees what he wants to take place. And, and just to make reference to what he said earlier, God does want moral evil to take place. That's why it takes place. And if God didn't want moral evil to take place, guess what? Guess what? The crucifixion would have never taken place in the first place. And we would all still be in our sin. You see the problem here? You see the problem here? He just said, if God, if we see a passage that seems to indicate or imply that God wants moral evil to take place, uh, you better interpret that passage differently because that's not who God is. God uses evil for good. That is why we have passages like Genesis 50 verse 20. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. What's the it? What's the antecedent for the word it? It's evil. So we could translate that verse paraphrasing and say this and be correct you meant evil against me but god meant the evil for good and be correct which means god uses evil for good god wants moral evil to take place so he can use it for good in the ultimate sense and so that god <clears throat> can demonstrate in his decree that there is no such thing as purposeless evil. No such thing. That is why we have verses like Romans 8.28. God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. I'm quoting the New American Standard, 1995. That's what it says. And I like that verse. I like that translation. He's kept his hand off, and he didn't prevent something from happening. And when he, and when he does so, Scripture sometimes acts as if or treats it as if it's an active will of God. If God takes his hands off anything, then... Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 which says God upholds all things by the word of his power Colossians chapter 1 verse 17 in him we live and move sorry in him all things hold together Acts chapter 17 verse 28 in him we live and move and have our being Revelation chapter 4 verse 11 blessed are you our Lord and our God to receive glory and honor and power because you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. If God is ever hands off, then whatever God takes his hand off, it ceases to exist. Because everything de de depends on God's upholding its existence for it to exist. So if God is ever hands off, not only is that teaching the heresy of deism, God created the universe and left it to run on its own, or rather semi-deism, because what Leighton Flowers believes is that God takes his hands off when evil actions and desires occur, which means that he's trying to absolve God of evil and immoral things but if he says God takes his hands off he is denying Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 Colossians 1 17 Revelation 4 11 Acts chapter 17 28 God is never hands off never what he's about to say is unbiblical when in reality it's more of a permissive will of God and that we can protect the concept of the biblical view of holiness by saying God doesn't desire for any to perish. God doesn't desire for anyone to lie, to sin, to cheat, to, to murder, to do anything. In his prescriptive will, right, 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 so right, 
but he denies the fact that God brings about evil. God ordains evil. God decrees evil and then uses it for good, which is biblical. He denies all of those verses, all of those passages. And when he gets to them, he uses human analogies by putting God into the human box. And then, because that's all we know experientially, we agree with him. And Calvinism looks as though it's unbiblical. When all Leighton Flowers is doing is basically logical fallacies, category error, denying what we actually teach, and strawmanning our arguments and our perspective. That's all he's doing. <coughs> I apologize again. Sorry about that. Let's go. That is more. We're almost done. Totally wrong. So how do we deal with certain, especially Old Testament passages, which seem to indicate that God does desire something or does want something to happen? Well, we apply um, good hermeneutics to the text, just like Calvinists do with regard to God relenting or changing his mind. We explain those texts within the context of the whole of Scripture, and we help people to see that though, yes, the authors may have expressed it in this manner, we know that God is holy. He is totally separate from evil. He doesn't even look, he's so pure of eyes, he doesn't even look upon evil. He doesn't desire uh, for evil to come to pass. He doesn't even pass through his mind, according to Jeremiah 7.31. Um, and, and Jeremiah 7.31, for God does not command the burning of the children of the Israelites. Prescriptive will. Prescriptive will. It's like any verse he quotes refutes his position because the Bible is so clear on the fact that God has two wills but he denies that God has two wills and those passages oh my goodness I can't wait as this playlist grows for you all to see how Leighton Flowers deals with the passages that literally teaches that God decrees evil to take place literally and because he denies that God has two wills he confuses the Word of God to the listeners so many other passages that indicate God's holiness which which literally means his separateness from moral evil he is separate from that he the, the evil will is autonomous Anytime a man acts in a moral evil way, he's acting autonomously, separately from God. That autonomous will of man is just another word for holiness, for God. Big, big logical problem here. Whenever, okay, the evil will of man is autonomous. Think about this for a moment. That's deistic. That's dualistic, and that's unbiblical, illogical as well. If man's will is autonomous, then that means it arises ex nihilo because God isn't the one who is the foundation for the existence of the will of man that brings about the evil. If man's will, when it's evil, is autonomous, then the actions that arise from his evil will, if God has nothing to do with it, what we have here is God not having any involvement in what takes place, which means that it did not arise from God's action of creating and sustaining, which means that God does not know what is going to take place when man decides to do evil because God's knowledge is rooted and grounded in his action. God knows perfectly the results of his action, therefore God knows all things because everything that God has created is the foundation or rather, everything that God has created is the result of his action. Therefore, because he knows the results of his actions perfectly, he knows the future. But if God's action is not the foundation of the will of man when man does evil, then God does not know what man will do when he does evil. 
Not only is that dualistic, theistic, but it's also pan, it's also open theistic, open theism. This is a problem. It's a big problem. And as time goes by, you're going to all see, when Leighton Flowers tries to deny Calvinism, he's all over the place. He's in Mullenism. He's in open theism. He's in dualism. He's in deism. And as you'll, as you'll see eventually, he calls himself a provisionist. So it's provisionism. So Arminianism, provisionism, Mullenism, open theism, deism, and dualism. He takes arguments from all of these and try to refute Calvinism. But all of those positions are unbiblical when it comes on to these kinds of conversations. All of them. Every single one of them. Man is autonomous when he does evil. Wow. Wow. The positive side is the holiness of God. The negative side is the <laughs> autonomy of man. Anytime someone, a creature, Satan, myself, anybody else, does anything evil, he's acting autonomously of the holy God. Now, anytime, anytime he, um, he does something in response to God, that's not autonomous. Obviously, if God goes to an enemy and says, I want you to come to me, then he is acting in response to God. And that's not an autonomous um, uh, choice or an action. That's in response to a gracious appeal of God, the revelation of God. And so when I talk about... That can be, that a gracious appeal of God, that can be denied. So God tries to save everyone equally, and not everyone is saved. So God fails to save them. If God tried to save John Doe and John Doe ends up in hell, John Doe will be in hell for all eternity, which means that, logically speaking, <coughs> God will be a failure for all eternity. God is the eternal failure. If God tries to save someone and they are not saved and they go to hell for all eternity, about men acting autonomously, I am talking about their sinful actions. Um, mankind can only respond to the gracious, goodness, enabling work of the Spirit drawing people to himself. And so anytime someone comes to faith, that's not an autonomous action. That is in response um, to God. He said enabling work of the Spirit just now. And that's why we are held. That's not an enabling work of the Spirit drawing. Mankind can only respond to the gracious, goodness, enabling work of the Spirit drawing enabling work of the spirit drawing them wait a minute is it that calvinism ah uh, leighton the enabling work of the spirit to enable you to do something that you can't do otherwise ah uh, that's calvinism that's that just come back if you were ever truly a calvinist Come back to the fold, bro. Come back to the fold. Drawing people to himself. And so anytime someone comes to faith, that's not an autonomous action. That is in response um, to God. And that's why we are held responsible to the revelation of God, because we are truly able to respond. We are held responsible to the revelation of God because we have the natural faculty ability to respond, but we don't because we don't desire to respond, hence not having the moral ability and because God has given us a law, he has created responsibility as an act. <clears throat> responsibility is an aspect of creation because God has given a law. That is how God holds us accountable. Not because we are able to respond morally, but because we're able to respond naturally and we don't because we don't desire to do so holds us accountable for breaking his law hopefully this has been helpful today to help understand the difference between true god's desire for all to be saved and that even calvinists 
though inconsistent in doing so, I believe, can and should affirm the very clear biblical teaching that God does desire the salvation and does give a well-knit offer to every single person in the world, come and repent. I we don't deny that. We just distinguish it from is the creative will, which you don't want you all to come. I want all to be saved through repentance and faith. Prescriptive will. One last note. I just thought of this. Some Calvinists will say, well, if you have God desiring for people to be saved and they're not being saved, then isn't God failing? Yes, he is. And there's no way, shape, or form that you can say anything else that will be convincing. Well, again, th that, that's a, a convolution of your beliefs, Calvinistic beliefs, onto us. We no, no, it's not. It's not. It's us stepping into your ideology and giving it an internal critique and showing you that your perspective on God is unbiblical and it makes God out to be a failure. We don't believe that God wants people to irresistibly be saved. and he's God wants his elect to irresistibly be saved and they are irresistibly saved. Not every human being. He's failing at doing it. If God wanted to irresistibly save somebody, he could. He's God. Um, God does. And he does, and he does save people irresistibly. He does draw them irresistibly. He does. He's God. Thanks for saying it. He doesn't want that, according to our view. According to your view, which is an unbiblical view, God doesn't want that. But biblically speaking, God does want that, so you're just being unbiblical. God wants people to freely repent, to freely respond. That's God's desire. So that's the way he's, he's planned it. That's the way he's worked it out to give. And I would love to see you show from Scripture that man has free will. Give people revelations so that they are able to respond to him. That's his desire. That's how he has made the world. And so our, our view is not that God's trying to irresistibly save people. And no, your view is that God is trying to save people equally. Some come to him and some don't. Failing. Um, God's desire is for people to come freely to repentance and faith so as to be saved because that's the provision that he has given to all mankind. You believe that God is trying to save everyone equally and some of them are saved, therefore God is failing at saving the others. There is no way to get around that because it's logically valid and it's the logical implication of saying that God is trying to save everyone equally. That's what you believe. We are not pushing our perspective on you and saying that you have to believe God is trying to save everyone irresistibly. God is not trying to save everyone irresistibly. God is saving his people that he has decreed before the foundation of the world to save. And they come to him irresistibly because he changes their desire. I'm glad you said it. That, that God can do it because he's God. <laughs> yeah, he can because he's God. And that's how he has chosen to do so. Kind. And so um, that's just a, a, a categorical error on the Calvinist part to say that, that we believe that God's trying to do something that he's failing at doing because he's not trying to irresistibly save people. He is providing salvation for all mankind and calling people. Um, he's making an appeal to be reconciled to God. He did not provide salvation for all mankind. He didn't. He did not. He provided salvation for his elect. And he determines what, he determines when in time he will draw them to himself. But let's go to the passage that he's going to quote now to say that God provided salvation for mankind. As 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, that we are a crisis in us, making the appeal through us, be reconciled to God. And that's his desire for all to be reconciled through um, a response to his call and to his... Okay, so he's reading 1 Corinthians, sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Paul is making reference to the Christians in Corinth who were not living up to the standard that God has set for them. They weren't living like Christians. As you know, First and Second Corinthians are indictment letters because they were not 
acting like Christians. Paul is saying, be reconciled to God. As you know, this can rightly be said to a true believer. Why? Because sometimes true believers fall into seasons of sin. And we have to, as we repent and our fellowship is restored, which was provided for us in our initial reconciliation, when we repent, this ongoing restoration of our fellowship, ongoing restoration of our reconciliation takes place because there is a temporal reality of our reconciliation where we fall into sin and we come out of it because of the grace of God and we are renewed and we are reconciled to God over and over again. But there is an initial reconciliation which is mentioned in the previous verses. It says this, now all these things are from God, verse 18, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. God reconciled us to himself on the basis of the work that Christ did. Namely, verse 19, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. World meaning all kinds of people because that's what the church is made up of, Jews and Greeks, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. If God does not count trespasses against anyone, then that individual is saved. That individual is God's elect. That is why Paul says in verse 20, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. Be, we beg you, be reconciled to God. Why? Because of the initial reconciliation, be restored, renew your relationship and fellowship with God because you have been reconciled. This is consistent. That is why the following verse says this, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, who? The elect, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is making reference to God's people. You see, when you read verses in context and not just take a verse out of its context and place it into your system that you came to the Bible with, which is your presupposition, you see what happens when you just look at the context? You see that. Anyways, he's finishing up now. His revelation to his word, powerful double-edged sword of his word that calls us and is sufficient to enable anyone who hears it to respond to it. That's Calvinism. God's word is sufficient to enable anyone to respond. Ah! God's word, the Bible says, faith comes by hearing and by hearing the word of Christ. Romans chapter 10. God's word is sufficient to enable anyone to respond. What kind of response? the moral response. Because prior to hearing God's word, they had no moral ability. But God is the one who uses the power of his word when he sees fit. And that word gives you the moral ability, the desire, and then you come to God. Thank you, Leighton. Thank you. Thank you. See? It is impossible, if you're a Christian, not to speak like a Calvinist, because Calvinism is what was derived from Scripture. There is no way that you can escape it. No way. You have to literally have prior traditions that you are devoted to, to deny Calvinism, or be really emotional. <laughs> Because Calvinism is logical and biblical. And if you are very emotional, then you will sometimes interpret God's word through the lens of your emotions and your feelings and end up being unbiblical in your conclusions. That's just the reality of life, man. But fortunately for us, there are errors that we can have that are not heresy. All heresy is error. But not all error is heresy. 
fortunately for us. Error. You can have error and still end up in heaven. But you can't have heresy and end up in heaven. And I hope that in our journey in responding and evaluating Leighton Flowers' videos, I don't stumble on any heresy because I am not afraid to say that this man is going to hell if he does not repent of his heresy. That is why I always tell any open theist who believes that God learns, that's heresy. You're not a Christian because God does not learn. God knows all things. At least just say you admit mystery and that you don't know how God knows all things. But don't say that he learns. Don't say that. That's heresy. You go to hell for that. Ooh. It's true. Um, if you have questions about those who can't hear the gospel, who are, haven't heard the gospel, um, what about them? I have just uh, recently did a blog post on um, uh, soteriology101.com that asked that question. What about those who never hear the gospel? And so I encourage you to go there if you want to read more about um, God's um, holding man responsible who never hear the light of the gospel. Romans chapter 1 verse 20. For since the creation, before this, but before, for since the creation of the world, <clears throat> his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen. Therefore, they are without excuse. General revelation is sufficient to condemn all people who do not believe in the true God. But it is insufficient to save. General revelation is sufficient to condemn, but insufficient to save. Special revelation is necessary for salvation. That's why the Bible says faith comes by hearing and by hearing the word of Christ. And in that chapter it says his word has gone out to the whole world. That is making reference to Psalm chapter 19, where it's speaking about his general revelation. And it is upon that basis that no one has any excuse because they know that God exists and they go against the law of their conscience and they are judged on the basis of their evil desires and evil actions when they break the law of God that he placed on their conscience. They are sent to hell for denying the true God. Romans chapter 1 verse 20 teaches that people who get general revelation have no excuse. The Bible does not teach that if you don't hear the gospel, you somehow have an excuse. God, you didn't send me the gospel. No, you don't have an excuse. You know that God exists and you know that what you were doing was wrong and you still did it. And you have evil desires because you denied the law of God on your heart and it is upon that basis that you are sent to hell because of your evil actions, not because you didn't hear the gospel. <clears throat> and at this point, I would like to also say that Leighton Flowers says that Calvinism gives people the biggest excuse because a man can stand before God on the day of judgment and say, you didn't choose me to be saved. This is your fault that I'm going to hell. And while that's ludicrous, I can put the shoe on the other foot. You, Leighton Flowers, have to deal with that problem that you have created. You know why? Because anyone, in your view, can look at God on the Day of Judgment and say to God, you created me knowing I would be like this and you still created me and now I'm on my way to hell. This is your fault. And that's ludicrous, isn't it? Yes, it is. Because you would say that men did what they wanted to do in breaking God's law and therefore they are held accountable to breaking God's law. And the Calvinists would say that 
men have the natural ability to obey God's law, but they chose not to obey God's law because they did not have the moral ability, which is desire to obey God's law. They didn't desire to obey His law, therefore, they disobeyed His law, and on that basis, they are sent to hell. Not because God didn't choose them. And in your view, not because God made them that way, but rather because they did exactly what they wanted to do, and as a result, they are going to hell. And I'm going to say that every time you make reference, as you will, in our future analysis of Leighton Flowers' ideology. He will mention that Calvinism gives people an excuse because they could tell God, you determined that I would go to hell, so it's your fault, not my fault. Thanks for tuning in. We'll talk to you less next time. And we're done. Does God love and desire all to be saved? Hello and welcome to Sociology 101. We're going to answer the question, does God desire all to be saved? Simply put, yes. I think the Bible... And we will get to this video when we get to this video. As you can see, it is 30 minutes, 31 minutes long. Not going to respond to this video right now. I think I have spent enough time. I have been recording this now for one hour and 46 minutes for a 16-minute video on my first reaction. Oh, my goodness. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. I'm going to definitely make some st some time stamps on this so that you can all uh, know where to click so that you can watch the video here and know when I hit a particular topic and always know where to go to and where to make reference to when you are trying to understand what the answer is to these objections that will be raised by Leighton Flowers and his followers and those who are anti-Calvinistic. But I apologize for my first reaction video to be an almost two hours long for a 16-minute reaction video. I'm sorry, guys. Anyways, like, share, subscribe, and have yourselves a wonderful day. God bless you all. Or wonderful night, wonderful morning. God bless you all, my brothers. And be consistent, my friends.